The next thing we're going to talk about is genetic engineering. I personally think the concept of genetic engineering is very, very, it's quite mind, it's quite fascinating. OK, so let's have a look at some of the learning objectives and some of the things we would like to address. So when we talk about genetic engineering, we need to be able to talk and describe the process of genetic engineering and we need to be able to explain what a host bacteria is, what are restriction enzymes, what are ligase enzymes, what on earth are sticky ends and what are vectors. Bear these in mind, I'm about to open up the chat and I'm going to ask you some of these questions. Genetic engineering, we need to know that genetic engineering takes place at the early development of the host organism so that it will develop the desired characteristic. So it's all about developing things with desired characteristics. You need to know that some plant crops have been genetically modified to be resistant to disease or produce bigger yields. OK. We also need should know that bacteria has been genetically modified to produce insulin. So there's a real life example of genetic engineering and we need to be able to discuss the potential benefits and risks of genetic engineering and talk about how modern medical research is exploring the possibility of genetic modification in some inherited disorders. So when we talk about genetic engineering, it's the process that modifies the genome of an organism by inserting a gene with a desired function or outcome into the organism. And it's sometimes known as genetic modification. So it's the whole idea that we are taking an organism's genome, okay? And we are saying, hang on a second, I wanna modify you, so I'm gonna put in something extra, okay? And then you're gonna turn, and you're gonna sort of end up developing that desired characteristic, okay? Now, some important genetic engineering terms. A host bacterium is going to carry the inserted gene. The host bacterium is going to be the one that's going to replicate the gene multiple times and produce the desired product. A DNA vector. This is a DNA molecule, normally a virus or a plasmid, that is used to carry a foreign genetic material into another cell. Restriction enzymes cut DNA at specific points and ligase enzymes joins DNA at specific points. Sticky ends are the cut ends of a gene and DNA vector. Now I'm just going to sort of elaborate on some concepts here. OK, now before I show you the next sort of slide. So if this is a plasmid, right? And we have, say, for example, I mean, you guys all know your DNA looks like this. And we, if we were to sort of open it up, we will have a particular gene that we're interested in. OK, so there's your plasmid. There's your um, uh, DNA that we're interested in. So remember, we said that a plasmid is a DNA molecule from a virus or a, a um, bacteria that is used to carry a foreign genetic material into another cell. So there's your that's your DNA vector. So what we effectively want to do is if we want it, we want to basically insert this gene into here. And the question is, how are we going to do it? So the first thing we will have to do is we have to create space in that plasmid. So what I will end up doing is I will cut the plasmid open. OK, and remove that section of DNA. And this is when the restriction enzyme comes into play. It's cutting the DNA at specific sites. Restriction enzymes will do the same thing over here as well. We will cut the DNA at specific sites, OK? And to sort of extract that particular gene we're after. What we then end up effectively doing is we are then going to insert this desired gene. Into our vector, OK? So if we just sort of for the purposes of color, we'll just make it blue. And obviously we're going to have to tape it up. And that's when your ligase enzymes come in. It joins the DNA at specific points. Now what I need to basically imagine is a more aesthetically looking DNA vector. We have this DNA vector with our desired gene inserted into it. I'm just sort of showing you the concepts because I don't want you to get confused when you see look at the next diagram. OK, so this is your vector. Now, this vector is effectively going to be transported into a host bacterium to carry the inserted gene. 
OK, so just sort of take on these concepts. It's going to start becoming a bit more clear when you look at the next diagram. And I want you to follow my red cursor. First of all, the DNA is removed from the organism with the desired characteristic. OK, there's the organism. Say, for example, we're looking for hazel eye colors. We're going to go into the DNA. We're going to look for the gene that carries the hazel eye colors. What we're going to do is we're going to effectively cut out that particular gene using restriction enzymes. So now we have a gene ready to go. On the other hand, we're going to take a plasmid from a bacteria cell. We're going to cut open the plasmid with restriction enzymes. Now what we have is we have a plasmid with some space and we have a desired gene. And what we're going to do is we're going to stick these two together with ligase enzymes. So the sticky ends from both the plasmid and the DNA strand are going to be attached using enzyme ligase. And what will then happen is the plasmid with the desired gene will be absorbed by the host bacterial cell. Non bacteria have the ability to replicate very, very rapidly, very, very fast. And what it ends up doing is it produces millions and millions of identical bacteria with the desired characteristic. So let's go over that again. We have the DNA in an organism with the desired characteristic. So say, for example, I want to reproduce a hazel eyes or something. I'm going to go into the DNA. I'm going to look for that particular gene that gives me hazel eyes. I'm going to use some restriction enzymes to cut out that particular gene. I'm going to go to a bacteria cell and get a plasmid. I'm going to remove that plasmid from the bacterial cell using, again, restriction enzymes. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut a bit of that plasmid out. Why are we cutting the plasmid out? Because we want to create space for our desired gene to enter into that plasmid. How do we stick the plasmid and the desired gene together? We basically fuse them with ligase enzymes. OK, and then what happens is once we have a plasmid ready with our desired gene, we want to absorb this back into the host bacterial cell. Bacterial cells have this intricate ability to produce millions of identical bacteria with the desired characteristic. And then we have now formed a. A system where we can end up producing a lot of the desired characteristic. OK, it's really nice and easy when you start following the colors and sort of follow the process. Again, not something you may become in, in completely familiar with in the first go, but if you repeat it a couple of times, we will go over it again when we do exam questions, it will become more apparent. Now, insulin is a very good example of genetic engineering and genetic modification to yield more of a particular product in medicine. Remember, we should know that insulin is the hormone that helps monitor blood glucose levels in the human body. In type 1 diabetes, the body cannot produce enough insulin and um, blood levels can get dangerously high or dangerously low. However, people with diabetes can inject themselves with insulin to resolve the issue. Genetically engineered bacteria produces human insulin. So in this scenario, what we'll end up doing is we will take human insulin gene, insert it into a bacterial plasmid, insert that plasmid into a bacterium and ask it to reproduce plenty of human insulin. Now, the reason this is so important is. We now have a source of producing lots and lots of insulin. And this diagram just explains it's the exact same thing we just discussed, but now the gene we are talking about in particular is the insulin. OK, and the final result is bacteria producing lots and lots of human insulin. Now, this is very, very important. And it was actually a very, very big scientific sort of um, development because before we were able to genetically modify organisms, people who had diabetes actually had to use insulin from pigs or cattle. And um, what's now happened is using genetic engineering, it's allowed a substantial amount of insulin to be made very, very quickly and very, very cheaply. It's much cheaper to breed a bunch of bacteria than it's to breed a bunch of pigs and cattle. OK, the other thing we need to consider is that because the insulin produced is human insulin rather than animal insulin, it is less likely to cause reactions. Remember when we take something from a foreign 
um, body and insert it into a host. The host may it may have the potential to reject it because of the presence of foreign antigens that the human body may not recognize. The other key thing to consider is some people are vegetarians, some have religious practices, and it may mean that they can't actually accept things from pigs or cattle. So it was we were basically not catering for an entire population of disease. So now having created this system where we were able to actually genetically engineer from um, bacteria, it's created a system where we're producing lots. It's being made very, very cheaply, less likely to cause reactions, and we are basically essentially catering for everyone. Now, you, genetic modification and engineering isn't only limited to um, bacteria, um, bacteria and sort of the production of human things. It's also very much involved in the genetic modification of crops. We can genetically engineer plants to produce plants with increased yields and lots of increased nutrition. A crop might be genetically engineered to be resistant to some type of disease or to produce bigger fruits, both of which will lead to maximum production and maximum yield of desired crop. These crops are genetically modified and we can modify crops in two different ways. And before we talk about which two examples, I want to talk about the golden rice phenomenon. Now, back in the day, and I, th I don't know how long ago they did this, but scientists actually added the beta carotin gene to wild rice to make something called gold rice. Beta carotin is actually needed in humans to make vitamin A. Vitamin A is actually very essential for good vision. And in some areas, people who have vitamin A deficiencies and this significant vitamin A deficiencies can lead to blindness. And the whole idea was, was it was to create rice that was very, very rich in vitamin A to prevent blindness. Now, obviously, we're talking about catering for a population that probably comes from a poor area, not very, very economically well developed. They're not going to have access to fancy vitamins that we can get in shops here everywhere. So it was designed to sort of create a staple for these people that contained a lot of vitamin A, where they were able to eat, eat it as staple food. So, you know, rice is a very good basic staple for many, many areas that are poor. And it would be giving the patients the source of vitamin A to prevent blindness. But obviously, it's a very, very nice concept and it's all hunky dory and it sounds very nice and sort of um, a good gesture. But we don't actually know that whether the beta carotene levels are high enough to prevent blindness, like what is our threshold? How much does actually, and remember you can eat all the vitamins in the world, but what is the bioavailability of that vitamin in your body? I can take a tablet of iron, but how much iron is actually absorbed into my blood to be utilized by my body? It's very, very low. Also, the golden rice might crossbreed with the wild type of rice and contaminate it. Many people are actually concerned, and obviously this will come back down to how much education you may have about the topic, that food from genetically modified crops may cause harm to people. It's also the idea that genetically modified crops can be patented and their seeds can be very, very expensive. If, it's a, if there is a place for it in the market, it ends up becoming very, very expensive. And the whole idea of actually helping a needy population then becomes very, very misconstrued. And this was an article I found about um, golden rice and is it good as golden? Can golden rice and other biofortified crops prevent malnutrition? And some of the things they sort of talk about is how malnutrition is one of the key contributors to disease. And it's the whole idea that we have this massive population, very, very malnourished. How can we modify using modern science their sort of food to enable them to sort of um, address these malnutrition. So that's where the whole concept of golden rice came from. What about genetically engineering disease? We can think about rice and malnutrition and how we can address it by increasing the value of the food they're eating. Genetic engineering is a very, very big topic in the management of disease. As we know, some diseases are caused by the mutation of a single gene. Okay, Huntington's cystic fibrosis, sickle cell anemia. 
Obviously, we know that these diseases are typically inherited and affect the quality of life of the person who has the disease. In recent years, scientists have developed things like gene therapy. And what it basically involves is the transferring of the non faulty version of the gene into the person. So therefore, their cells end up making the healthy version of the gene and hopefully replacing the faulty gene cells. Now, obviously, again, it contains more complications than just simply replacing all the cells. But gene therapy has a potential to cure many diseases is very, very high. It's a very hot topic. But there are obviously a lot of hurdles to overcome. How do you actually target the specific cells if they are widely dispersed across the body? We don't, because it's not been done and it's still new as the concept being explored, we don't actually know the side effects of the um, genetic, of genetic engineering. And it's also finding a reliable way to get the genetic material into the cells. How do we do that? We need to do a lot of experimentation before we get to that. There has been some success in clinical trials for hemophilia. So hemophilia is a disorder where people have bleeding issues. So they will have certain defects that cause them to bleed a lot. OK, and um, they could literally get a paper cut and bleed. Leukemia is an example of a white blood cell cancer and types of blindness, things like retinitis pigmentosa as well, all caused by gene defects and all, all being addressed in clinical trials by gene therapy to see if they are successful. But again, whether when and where this will become common practice is unknown because we don't know how long it's going to take to sort of get through all the approvals. Obviously, when we talk about certain processes, we did the same for selective breeding. We want to talk about the benefits and we want to talk about the risks associated with genetic engineering. We know that the benefits of genetic engineering is things like mass production of hormones that are needed in medicine such as insulin. It can improve crop yields by improving the growth. It allows crops to grow in harsh conditions and it allows them to make their own herbicide or pesticide. That's very particular to protect the crops. Being able to add extra vitamins to crops and grow them where there are huge populations that are very deficient in certain things can reduce disease burden. Greater yield could help solve world hunger. What are the risks associated with genetic engineering? It might affect the growth of wild flowers and the insects that rely on them. Remember, when we're talking about plants, we're not just talking about pests. Plants are sort of the source of food for many other um, insects and animals as well. We're sort of depleting animals of the nutrition. Remember, herbicides and pesticides produce biodiversity and biodiversity is needed in a population. It can also affect human health. We don't know that. A lot of people worry about ethics of altering nature. If we started genetically modifying crops, could this not lead to the whole genetic modifying, genetically modifying humans argument? Also, they might end up outcompeting their wild species if we continue to facilitate an environment where we are letting a particular type of plant grow. Eventually, they will outsource and outcompete the other species and we could cause them to become rare. We could reduce variation. So again, I keep saying the same thing about how this topic is a lot of friendly facts as opposed to really understanding what's going on. It's, it's a, I think personally think it's a very nice topic to sort of learn. And sort of apply common not, uh, concept to in the exam. So remember, we've just said that genetic engineering is a process that modifies the genome of an organism by inserting a gene with a desired function or outcome into the organism. We talked about the process of genetic engineering involving sort of cutting out the desired gene with restriction enzymes, inserting the gene into a vector, which will be something like a plasmid from a bacteria. We seal the sticky ends with the, an enzyme called ligase. And we allow the host bacteria to absorb the vector. And what that ends up doing is we end up we end up creating a means of mass producing this gene. Now we can also use genetic modification, genetic uh, modification, genet sorry, genetically modified plants. Um, we can genetically modify bacteria to produce insulin. 
Modern medicine is currently exploring the use of genetic modification as a source of treatment for certain diseases such as leukemia, retinitis pigmentosa, and um, there are obviously risks and benefits associated with genetic engineering. Now again, you guys should pretty much know the drill by now. We have looked at the theory. This is now going to be followed on by some exam questions, which I believe will take us very, very nicely into our lunch break. So question number five, the photographs show two breeds of cows. We've got this Frisian cow and we've got a Jersey cow. They all look very, very different, different colors, different height, different weight, a very, very beautiful example of variation in species. It says in parts A and B, draw a ring around the correct answer to complete each sentence. Cows produce their young calves by what? Is it cloning? Is it asexual reproduction? Is it sexual reproduction? Now you should know that all mammals, including cows, will reproduce with sexual reproduction because we have variation. If it was asexual or cloned, they would all look the same. Cows and the calves have many similar characteristics. The information of characteristics is carried by clones. Remember, clones is like a photocopy of a species. Embryos are the baby versions of the species. The actual information for characteristics is carried in the genes, remember, in the DNA. The information for characteristics is passed to the next generation in cells by what? Body cells, um, in cells called body cells, gametes or neurons. Remember, this is going to be gametes because that's what's carrying the inheritable material. This has highlighted neurons, but I reassure you it is gametes. OK, that's just a error on the slide. Now, part C. Frisian and Jersey cows can be both used for meat or to produce milk. It says the information here shows features of Frisian and Jersey cows. And they've got a little list of different things that are available from each cow. It says use only the information above to answer these questions. In your answers, you must make comparisons between the two breeds of cows. So what we have here is this question is a very um, particular question in which you just have to use the information there and it you have to sort of look at the information with a bit of an eagle eye. Now the question is asking us, in your answers, use only the information, not your own, to make comparisons between the two breeds of cows. So the first question is, give two advantages of a farmer keeping Frisian cows and not Jersey cows. So let's have a look. If we look at body mass, the Frisian cow is producing more body mass. So there's more meat to yield of it. Let's look at protein. Milk contains 3.4% protein. Here the milk contains 3.8% protein. So technically Jersey cows are better than that. The Frising cows can be milked for 325 days after giving birth. However, the Jersey cows can only be milked for 250 days. So therefore, there's more milking opportunities available in Frising cows. They can produce no milk for 55 days before having a calf. They produce no milk for 45 days before having a calf. So again, this is a bit more beneficial. Look at the amount of milk they're producing. They produce more than 30 litres of milk, or here they produce less than 30 litres of milk per day. So again, these are the sort of key things. So if we go back to the question, they're asking us two advantages of keeping the fries in cows. So what we can say is that the Frising cow um, yields more um, it yields more body mass, more meat. It can be milked for longer amount of days, therefore giving us more milk, more opportunities to milk the cows, and it definitely produces more milk per day. OK, more meat, more milk. It can be milked for more time. So remember, the answers must be comparative because technically, if you just say, you can get meat from the cow. Well, you can get meat from the Jersey cow too. It's the whole idea that it's more from one than the other. Then it says give two advantages of a farmer keeping Jersey cows and not Frisian cows. And we've already helped ourselves by sort of looking at the um, table. Remember, we said that this yields more protein than the Frisian cow and it can be milked and it the cutoff point from producing no milk is shorter 
than that for um, the Pfizer cap. Okay. So again, it contains more protein, uh, protein and less time before having a carpal number. I can't emphasize how easy it is to acquire these four marks if you just take some time with the information presented to you. Part D, it says cow's milk is different from human milk. Cow's milk should not be given to young human babies. Scientists in China have genetically engineered cows to produce human milk. Milk from these cows can be fed to young human babies. Then it asks you to define what genetic engineering is. Genes from one organism are transferred to a different organism. Cells are separated from an embryo and are transferred to host mothers. The nucleus from a body cell is transferred to an egg cell. So these two are sort of referring to the process of cloning, which we'll be discussing later. Genetic engineering is in fact taking genes from one organism and transferring them to a different organism. Now, this is you guys a fact but you can't actually see it unless I just bear with me one second show you guys the question first so the next question basically follows saying some people are worried about using milk from genetically engineered cows to feed human babies give one reason why well if it's from genetically engineered cows um, it's the whole idea I mean you can go into the ethics argument here you can talk about we don't actually know what the effect of the um, genetic, the engineered cow's milk is going to be. Are they, what's the potential and the risk of carrying pathogens from a cow to a human? So these are the things you have to consider. You don't know what the long term health effects are. There may be other things in the genetic engineered cow's milk that might harm the baby, such as bacteria or pathogens. So remember I was saying previously how some questions may accept the ethical argument somewhat and in this particular scenario they're saying ignore it so you have to think about the long-term side effects that you're unsure about and you also have to think about the fact that there may be other pathogens present that may harm the baby now this question isn't sort of just referring to a scientific phenomenon it's actually a real thing some babies can be allergic to children's um to cow's milk and it's called a cow's milk protein allergy and it's um, quite a co common thing that happens. It's, it's present in three in every 100 babies can develop cow's milk protein allergy in the first year of life. And it just means that they can't actually tolerate cow's milk. Their body ends up basically reacting to in an immune system, fighting to the antigens present in the cow's milk. And what ends up happening is the cow's milk protein allergy is the baby's own immune system reacting to certain proteins in cow's milk causing allergic symptoms. So now if you sort of Google different milk brands available, you can basically tether the child onto a milk that doesn't contain cow's milk, but contains all the nutrition that it needs for the child to grow. Okay, let's look at question three. Human growth hormone is made by the pituitary gland. So remember, if we look at the brain, there is this pea-sized organ in the brain called the pituitary gland. It releases a bunch of hormones. Now, the human DNA containing the gene for growth hormone can be taken from a white blood cell. It says, give the reason why the gene does not have to be taken from the cells in the pituitary gland. Why? And I thought about this question. I thought, mm, think about it. All our cells contain the same DNA. So if we were looking for a particular gene, we just have to dip into one cell in the human body to take that gene. We wouldn't have to go to that particular human cell. OK. So all cells in the human body contain the same genes and therefore they have the gene for the growth hormone. Remember, the key point here is, I mean, they're not asking you about this in particular, but remember, the only body cell they would not have, they would not be able to take the gene from is red blood cells. And the reason why is, remember, um, red blood cells are enucleated, uni sorry, and what that basically means, they don't declare it and contain a nucleus. If you don't have a nucleus, you effectively don't have any DNA. And th therefore, you won't be able to extract that particular gene from that red cell. However, all the other body cells will contain the same genes, the same DNA. Just a fun fact, growth hormone is a hormone, as indicated by his name, that helps us grow. A certain condition 
called acromegaly or otherwise known as gigantism as you can pretty much tell from this picture it's a very very giant human um this is where you have a lot of excess growth hormone and you end up with very very large body very large hands i mean they look like little ants come compared to this person just thought i'd throw in a bit of a fun fact so it says there's a figure so it says i know it says the figure above but we're it's on the next slide so just hang in there it says the figure above shows the plasmid contains two genes for antibiotic resistance a gene for resistance to the antibiotic ampicillin and a gene for resistance to the antibiotic tetracycline. Explain how the structure of enzyme 1 allows it to cut the gene for tetracycline resistance, but not the gene for ampicillin resistance. So let's have a look at this diagram first of all. So what we have here is that the diagram shows how scientists can use genetic engineering to produce human growth hormone. So what we have is that we have a plasmid, which is a ring of DNA. And what we can see over here is that we have a gene for ampicillin resistance. Remember, ampicillin is an example of an antibiotic, and we have a gene for tetracycline resistance. We also have the gene for growth hormone here. OK, and what we're basically doing is we are taking. So in this diagram, what they're effectively showing is that we are taking. We are um, using restriction enzymes, enzyme one, to cut out the gene for the growth hormone. And we are using enzyme one to cut out this gene for tetracycline resistance and we're creating that gap and then we are inserting our growth hormone gene into the bacterial plasmid and effectively breaking up the tetracycline resistance gene. Then we are reinserting this back into bacteria and now we have a bacterium plus a plasmid with a gene for the growth hormone and effectively we have a bacteria that has the gene for resistance to ampicillin but it does not have the gene for resistance to tetracycline because we've sort of disrupted that gene okay and that's all that's happening in this diagram now what the question says is Explain how the structure of enzyme one allows it to cut the gene for tetracycline resistance, but not the gene for ampicillin resistance. And this just goes back to the concept of how enzymes work. If we know anything about enzymes, remember that enzymes work by. There's your enzyme. Remember, they have an. Active site. And this active site is going to bind to a substrate. And what we find is that the active site and substrate are complementary to one another. And therefore it will only bind it to a particular substrate. Now, how this is involved in the enzymes concept here is that they're saying, why does enzyme one effectively allow for the cutting of this gene, but not that one? If you think about it, if you have two sets of genes, they are going to contain different bases they're going to be made up completely differently so just because the enzyme active site is going to fit and be complementary to gene for tetracycline resistance because the gene for ampicillin resistance is made up of different bases different proteins it's just not going to be complementary so it's taking two concepts into account do you understand that the fact that these are two different genes so effectively two different substrates two different genes, two different bases, etc. And do you understand how enzymes work? OK, so in your mark scheme, they are effectively looking for the concept that enzymes have a specifically shaped active site. The two antibiotic resistant genes have a different sequence of bases. So only the tetracycline gene fits the active site of the enzyme because it's complementary to the active site of the enzyme. So in this example, the substrate is that gene, okay? And because they're different, 
two different genes, they have they're effectively two different substrates. And only the substrate that is complementary to the active site of the enzyme is going to bind and be cut open. Now it says in the final step of the diagram, very few bacteria take up the plasmid containing the gene for growth hormones. Most bacteria do not take up a plasmid. It says complete the table below and put a tick in the box if the bacterium can multiply in the presence of the given antibiotic or put a cross in the box if the bacterium cannot multiply in the presence of the given antibiotic. So the bacterium plus plasmid with the growth hormone gene. So remember the bacterium with the plasmid with the growth hormone gene has the um, antibiotic resistance for ampicillin, but it doesn't have the antibiotic resistance for tetracycline. So where we have a bacterium with a plasmid with a growth hormone gene, it will multiply with ampicillin, but it won't multiply with tetracycline. Where we have a bacterium without a plasmid, we will have a scenario where it if there's no plasmid present, then it's there's no sort of um, it's not going to multiply. Anyway, if it doesn't have a plasmid, it doesn't have the resistance genes where we have a bacteria with an unmodified plasmid. So if we go back to the original diagram where we have an unmodified plasmid, which is basically this. It's got um, a gene for, to resist ampicillin and it has a gene to resist the tetracycline, therefore it can grow in both. OK, a bacterium without a plasmid, remember, contains no DNA. It's not going to grow whatsoever. OK, a very, very interesting way to use the knowledge given in your exam question stem to answer a question. Now it says the figure sh above shows how bacteria containing the gene for human growth hormone multiplies by cell division. This produces a clone of bacteria. It says explain why all the bacteria in this clone are able to produce growth hormones. This is because we are going from one bacteria to two. Then we're going, we're multiplying again and again, and we're basically replicating the parent copy again and again and again. And we do this by a process called mitosis, where we replicate the same bacteria again and again. And therefore, we end up producing cloning bacteria that are all able to produce the growth hormone. It is clone produced by asexual reproduction, i.e. mitosis. All genes are copied. And one of the ways in which you can further explain this is by saying every cell receives a copy, every cell effectively receives a copy of the gene every cell receives a copy of the growth hormone gene. Therefore, all the cells will produce the growth hormone. Part four. Insect pests can be controlled without using chemical insecticides. For example, the bacterium Bacillus, I'm just going to call it thuringiensis, produces a toxin extremely poisonous to certain species of insects. The gene which produces the toxin has been introduced into tomato plants. It gives them built in resistance to a range of insect pests that is not poisonous to humans. It explains step by step how the tomato plant is made resistant to some insect pests. So again, where do we draw it? So there's your tomato, OK, and. And there is your, for example, your plasmid or the, the DNA of the tomato. Now, effectively, what we are basically doing is we are taking a plasmid and we are inserting the desired gene of that plasmid, a desired gene into that plasmid. And in this one, the desired gene is the gene which produces the toxin that has been introduced into tomato plants. OK, so what we're effectively going to do is we're going to modify the genome of the tomatoes with a uh, with the insertion of this gene that allows the tomatoes to then produce the toxin. OK, and we're going to insert it into the tomatoes cells. So 
what effectively happens is that the toxin gene is cut out from the bacterium, okay? And um, it's transferred to the tomato chromosome and it makes the toxin in the tomato plant. And it's very important not to sort of dive into the whole spiel of the bacterial plasmid. It's a very, very simple process here. All we've done is we've taken the gene from our bacterium and we've inserted it. So if I was to continue with my little color scheme, we have basically inserted it into our tomatoes chromosome and eventually we will produce a yield of tomatoes with that gene in place. Now it says give two arguments for and two separate arguments against controlling insect pests in this way. We are genetically modifying tomatoes. How do we know that this in the future isn't going to yield greater harm for those who are consuming the tomatoes? How do we know that all the tomatoes that are incorporated into the, um, that have the gene incorporated into them, have actually taken up the gene, are able to produce resistance? How do we know that the um, insect pests that we are controlling are actually going to be, what if they end up going through a mutation and then they become resistant to the toxin that we've just genetically modified a million tomatoes for? OK, so the good things about it is that you end up reducing your use of chemicals such as pesticides and herbicides and stop spraying all your crops with all these awful chemicals. And the arguments against is you don't know what the long term effects are. You don't know if you're going to end up actually producing plants that are going to be very well protected against this particular pest. How do you what, what do you do when you end up introducing a new pest into the population? Are you going to genetically modify it again? So these are the sort of considerations you have to make. It's good because we are sure that we know that the tomatoes kills the pests. Humans will not be eating the toxic insecticide. You don't have to buy the insecticide again. You're not using that much chemicals either. And remember, I don't know if you guys are familiar with how insecticides are sort of sprayed on. I had a picture here somewhere. But they literally take this big hose pipe nozzle spray and they spray it. How do you know it's actually getting to all your crops? Now, the other thing is, is that the against argument and some of the things we basically touched on was the idea that you're not sure how the gene will affect other tomatoes. You don't know whether the toxic toxin is going to affect other organisms that feed on the plants. Remember that when the plant the plants don't just grow in isolation, plants grow and flourish and they are other animals and insects are dependent on them. You know, you can't predict the effect of mutations. You could mutate to form a human toxin. You don't know. So there's a lot of unsurety when you do things like this. Another question, it says this question is about genetic engineering again. There is a shortage of human transplant organs. Researchers are growing genetically engineered pig cells containing human genes in the laboratory. The researchers claim that their work can help save thousands of lives a year. It says the graph shows the growth curve of the genetically engineered pig cells. Use data in the graph to describe how the number of cells changes. So again, it's just a matter of taking some time with the data. So what we have here is we between zero and three hours, there is basically nothing happening. And then between three to six hours, so maybe three to four hours, there's a gradual increase. And by three to five hours, we have an increase in 100 cells. Now between six, five and effectively seven hours, we have this mass reproduction of cells and then it starts to taper off until there is no more increased production. OK, so you just have to take these individual components. So it says qualitative description of graph, which includes two phases. So we've got this slow increase at the start, then rapid increase, and then there's followed by decline. So three key things here that we are seeing, we're seeing the gradual increase then we've got the fast increase and the decline. You can use qualitative where you just describe it or you can be quantitative and take values like I was. Then it says the research team wants to genetically engineer pigs so that they can produce organs that are not rejected 
by humans. Describe how they could do this. So the reason why we have any rejection taking place in the first place is imagine if this is a pig and this is a human. What basically happens is, is that the humans contain antigens. So the pig contains antigens that the human does not recognize. And then you have this immune system response to it. Kind of goes a bit like, uh, -uh I'm not having this. So if we can basically design an organ that is producing human like antigens and proteins, you're effectively producing an organ that is very much accustomed to the human body. So then when you insert the human, that organ into the human, it's less likely to be rejected because there's a reduced amount of rejected material. So what you end up basically doing is you select the gene or antigens for human tissue types, because the whole idea is that it's pig tissue versus human tissue, right? You basically isolate that gene and insert this gene into the embryo of the pig and you replicate the gene cells and you check cells for the expression of that particular gene. So it's the whole idea that you're taking this particular gene from the human and inserting it into your pig cells and checking the expression of the gene. Because if we have the expression of the gene, you have the expression of the antigens and therefore these antigens will then be, if it's antigens based on humans, the humans will recognize it as self and there'll be reduced um, likelihood of rejection. It says some people are against genetic engineering research and other people consider it to be a medical breakthrough. Despite the potential benefits, transplants using genetically engineered organs have been banned. Do you think the government should allow these organs to be used in transplants? So you either say yes, or you say no, okay? If you say yes, you wanna say things like, well, if we are able to create more transplants, we end up reducing the waiting time. To get a transplant nowadays, it's, the waiting time is insane. People who need kidneys are on the kidney transplant list for years. They have, they're on like eight to 10 years of kidney dialysis before they even access the, the transplant. Do you reduce disease burden? Possibly, because then you have less sick people, you have less people on other treatments to keep them going. You're giving them a functional organ. What about when you say no? Well, do you know the effects of genetically engineering organs and transplanting them into humans? No. Do, how do we know that this is going to be accepted by the human body in the long run? There's a lot of unsurety when it comes to this. OK, and all they're asking for is basic points. So we can say how arguments against this research. So if you're saying no, you want to say things like you don't know the consequences of inserting mammals into humans. And again, a fun thing you have to really consider is that religious arguments, are people going to be OK with having a pig inserted inside them? So, you know, it's, you have to take that into account. When we're saying arguments for, remember, you have to think about the context we're discussing this in. You reduce the donor shortage, you save human life, we've got health costs will be reduced because the people will be benefiting from the actual functioning organ as opposed to having expensive treatment to um, maintain their life. Okay, 